Good morning. It's my pleasure this morning to baptize my friend and my brother, Michael Childs, uh, today. I'm so excited about his profession of faith in Christ. Uh, I know there's many in the audience that are connected to Michael. More, most importantly, his mom and dad, T.W. and Tiffany Childs, his brother, T.C. Childs, sitting back there by his dad, and of course, probably the most important would be uh, his grandmother and grandfather, Susan and Terry Childs. Anyway, we're glad that you're here this morning, and gl- glad to celebrate this time with you. Michael, have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Then, because of your public profession of faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live because he lives in us. I just want to take a moment to welcome everybody to Crossroads this morning. If you're a guest with us this morning, we'd like to know that you're here. I know we have a special guest, Chad Purcell. I I know he didn't run out. I saw him earlier. But Chad, we're so glad you're here. There you are, sitting back there with your wife. All right, very good. Saw you, brother. Thank you. Uh, Look forward to hearing uh, the message that God has laid on your heart. All the rest of you, if you're a guest with us, either online or in-house, We'd appreciate it if you'd fill out our guest registration form. Let us know how we could minister to you, how we could pray for you, how we could just uh, be the church of Jesus Christ to you through loving hands and arms. We want to minister to you and make you welcome. The Crossroads family, let's welcome our guests the way we welcome our guests. Now, if you will, join me in a word of prayer as we ask God to meet us in this place. Father, we come to you now. We ask you for your presence in this place. God, fill this place with your spirit. Let us hear from you this day. Let us leave here encouraged and strengthened to do your will, to do your service. God, we give you the praise and the glory for all that's done here this day and the days ahead. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. This is a time when we come together and read scripture as a body of Christ. So uh, we're going to be reading 1 John 4, chapter 7, or verses 7 through 12. And I'm going to ask you to stand as we read. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God. God. Whoever does not does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son an atoning sacrifice for Dear friends, as God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in and us, and his love is made complete in us. Amen. Please you may stand. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Please join me as we praise God and how great thou art.
Praise God. So I'm going to need some help singing the Timothy or the Turtle Tales song. So boys and girls, come on down. Give me a hand.
good singing, y'all. Well, as you look around and go, well, that's not Brother Doug. Well, Brother Doug's not feeling well today, so he gave me the call. My name is Shad, and I don't have Timothy, but when I was young and I was becoming a pastor, I was so admiring of Brother Doug, and he had a teaching friend, so I got my own teaching friend, but he's asleep. He's always sleepy. He's a sleepy dog. His name is Shiloh. If in the Bible you see there's a place called Shiloh, it means place of rest. Well, Shiloh is always resting. If we say, wake up Shiloh, I bet he'll wake up. Think you can help me wake him up? All right, one, two, three. Wake, wake up, up Shiloh! Shiloh! Oh, 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 oh. Was that an egg? Hey. I'm awake now. Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Penelope. Hi, baby, baby. Shiloh, were you sleeping again in church? Caught me. Yep. <laughs> That was a big breath, Silo. Yep, yep, big breath, big breath. Got luck. Can you smell my breath? <gasps> no. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> well, Shiloh, let's talk about breathing. Do you know what the longest someone has ever held their breath? Uh, 30 seconds. No. Longer. Do you have a guess? Do you have Ten a guess? Minutes. 10 minutes. Longer. <gasps> the longest one anyone's ever held their breath was over 24 minutes. How long can you hold your breath? Let's see. <gasps> I'm already done. Do you remember your first breath? Do you remember, really? The day you were born? Yes. You remember that first breath? Um, yes. The Bible has something to say about breath and being God-breathed. In fact, Timothy, I mean, sorry, <laughs> Shiloh, <laughs> do you know a book in the Bible called Second Timothy? I thought Timothy wasn't here. Yeah, but in the Bible, there's a book called 2 Timothy, and it says this. It says that all Scripture is what? God breathed. God breathed it. What does God's breath smell like? I don't know. Mint. Mint? Do you think it's mint? But all Scripture, God breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in all righteousness. Thank you. Now I have egg breath. And you know what else the Bible says is God breathed? What? Us. Well, he breathed us. He did. Smell. When God created the world, he would just say the word and there it was. When he created the plants and the animals and the trees, he would just say the word and there it was and it was good. But when God made us, when God made people, he breathed. God breathed. So the only two things in the Bible that are God breathed are his word, the scripture, and us, his people. It's kind of like when you have a friend and you find things in common and then you want to be with them because you have the things in common. Exactly, Shiloh, you get it. We have in common with the scripture that we're both God-breathed, so we should spend a lot of time together. I like that. So will you pray with me? Dear God, help us, your God-breathed children, to spend lots of quality time with your God-breathed word. I thank you for my friends today. I pray that they spend time with you and in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you for eggs. Hi. My name is Mary Sue King. This is the first day of the week of prayer for North American missions. It's also the first of the month for the Annie Armstrong mission offering. When I was seven years old, my family moved to Montana and that my dad was pastor there. That's where I fell in love with missions. And that's where I learned about the whole mission board. I want you to think about the North American Missions Board as the Home Mission Board on steroids. And we're going to see a video in just a minute. And as you're watching this video, think this way. I got to contribute to these things. Because every person who gives to Crossroads Baptist Church contributes. Part of that money goes to the North American Mission Board. So you're already part of this. It's so exciting. Um, there's some other things you can do through this month. One is to make a designated mission offering to the 
Annie Armstrong Mission Offering. Take this prayer guide and pray your way through it. And if you get behind, just give yourself a month to pray through this. Um, every once in a while, notice the bulletin board that's across from the men's bathroom. And if you would like to learn some more about it, on Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock, the Women on Mission is meeting here, and everyone's invited. So would you pray with me now? God, we're so thankful that we have a part in your ministry throughout North America. Even things that we don't know are going on, we're helping with. Thank you so much. Thank you for this denomination who established these amazing mission organizations. Thank you for this church who has consistently been generous. Be with us this time as we try to find out what you want us to do to help with North American missions this month. I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. When you and your church give, you send hope. In small towns, big cities, and college campuses, God uses your sacrificial giving and your partnership with the North American Mission Board to make this happen over and over again. And at NAM, we think it's important for you to know how God uses your gifts to produce results. Southern Baptist churches like yours fund North America missions through two primary sources. First, through cooperative programs. Your gifts to the CP typically come from your church budget and then go directly to your state convention. Each state then sends a portion of that money to the SBC Executive Committee, and from there, more than half of CP goes to the International Mission Board. NAM, SBC Seminaries, and other entities receive a percentage as well. NAM receives 22.79% of cooperative program dollars. We use those funds to support evangelism events, to support ministry centers and missionaries, to endorse chaplains, and for operations. Altogether, those funds make up 35% of our budget. But the largest part of NAM's budget, 50%, comes from the Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. More than 100 years ago, this offering was named for a bold missions advocate who rallied SBC churches in support of missionaries. Today, Southern Baptists have thousands of missionaries serving in North America. They are spreading the gospel through Sin Network, our church planning arm, and Sin Relief, our evangelistic compassion ministry area. And when you give to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering through special offerings, your church budget, or directly to NAM, you're helping these missionaries by providing the fuel to assess, train, coach, and care for them. It helps pay for things like Bibles, curriculum, ministry equipment, or even rent for a worship facility. Some churches may refer to this offering as the North America Missions Offering or something else. Whatever you choose to call the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering, it is unique because every dollar goes directly to support missionaries where the need and the opportunity are the greatest. It goes all over North America, including our largest, most influential cities where the gospel presence has been on the decline. Your giving helps plant new, reproducing churches. And now, in many urban areas, we're starting to gain ground. It goes to places like international and refugee communities where tens of thousands of people, many from countries close to the gospel, move every year. Your giving is sending missionaries to love them and share the hope of Christ. In a hundred different ways, in a thousand different places, all of your gifts are enabling missionaries to start new churches, baptize new believers, and make disciples. That's how your giving works. As you pray and give, we at the North American Mission Board are so grateful to be your partner, helping you fulfill the Great Commission. Together with you and your church, every day we are sending hope. Jesus shared a parable about a man who built his house on sand, and the storms came, 
and the stress came, and the house fell. But he said there was a man that built his house on a rock, and when the storms came, and when the stresses came, the house stood. Jesus is our firm foundation. Amen. Please stand together with us.
Let's start with a wilderness story and let's close with the wilderness story today. Start with the story, just a few years ago, I was running in the wilderness, kind of in the shadow of Government Canyon State Park, trail running after sunrise, going through the trails, and then I have a, I have a propensity to wander, a little curiosity of like, what's over there? So I, I kind of find myself following some more like wild game trails through some areas, and it's a, it's a good morning, a great morning in nature, and then what was a sunrise turned into like, the sky is dark. Thunder clouds roll in and then thunder clouds open up and they just crowd down with rain on me and I realize I got to get out of this, this wilderness area. And as I'm trying to make my way out of the wilderness, I hear something primal, something protective, something growling, a deep angry growl at me. I'm having a close encounter with a mama mountain lion, mama mountain lion and her cub. Exactly. And now something, now something very primal, something very protective wells up in me. The amygdala part of my brain is in like full force fight or flight, and I don't know if it's going to charge at me, but I know I got to get out there. So I, I you know, scoop down a big old rock as big as I can, and I let out my protective growl right back at it. And slowly but surely, I got away, because I didn't want to die that day in, in the woods in the rain wearing running shorts. <laughs> Lived to tell the tale, but I got out of there, got home. Now, have you ever had a close encounter with a lion? I would bet you do. I bet you have. If you look at 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober-minded, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a what? Roaring lion. A roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. So, we've had these encounters with a, an adversary, the enemy, prowling around looking for us, anyone that he can devour, anyone not paying attention, anyone that's kind of going away from the herd, the easy pickings. So what are we to do? It says, be sober-minded, be alert. What else can we do? We've got to go to another verse in the Bible to see what else to do. If we go to Ephesians chapter 6, this is our primary text today. Ephesians chapter 6 tells us what to do. Be strengthened. Well, be strengthened by who? The Lord. Be strengthened by what? By His vast strength. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this dark, evil spiritual forces in the heavens. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having prepared everything, take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. Say it with me, please. The Word of God. This is what we focus on today. So every time I say the sword of the Spirit, I would hope that we could preach this to each other and you'll say it with me. The Word of God. It's practice. I say the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay, we're going to go today, church. How well are you wielding the Word of God? Now, if, I, if, if you'll allow me a little nostalgia, I'm going back to 11-year-old Shad right here in this church. It's Sunday evening, and it's sword drill time. We have our RAs, we have our GAs, and we have the Bible drillers. And now I've realized that you can turn the Bible into a competitive sport in church. I'm all in. And I stood right here, and our, our directors would, would, would call attention. We'd go, attention. Am I jogging any nostalgia? Anyone else? Show of hands. Who else did Bible drill? Okay, me and Stuart. Yeah, yeah, Bible drill. Strong. After church, we're going to have a Bible drill competition. Stuart's already game. I think he wins. Look very confident in his Bible drill abilities. So they say, attention. They go, draw swords. Get your sword. And they go, say, the, say like John 3, 16. And whoever could find it first and, and get it and then get to, if you got it, you got to speak it. So God's mercy is not lost on me right now as I'm welling up a little bit thinking as an 11-year-old boy, I was doing Bible drill, and now as a 
49-year-old grown man, I get to open the word of God with us. God's grace and his mercies, it's not lost on me right now. I compose myself. I wish I could say, though, from every year, from my teen years to now, I wish I could always say that every time I've had, a, had an enemy encounter, every time I've been under enemy fire, I have reached for the sword of the Spirit, which is the word, word of God. I wish I could say that, but the truth of the matter is way too often, under enemy fire, I've picked up a different weapon. I picked up the cap gun, the cap gun of lies. Is it a real gun? Did, I got it at Walmart. Do you think it was in the ammunition and hunting department? Do you think it was in the toy aisle? Toy aisle. I mean, a, a cap gun is really just a noisemaker. It's not really a gun. It has zero stopping power. It's just annoying. It might make you flinch with the noise. So when the enemy, like a prowling, growling lion, comes at us, and he is the father of lies. Lies are his native tongue. And we go, well, maybe I'll just go head to head, toe to toe, lie for lie with the enemy of lies. The enemy tempts us and lies to us in ways to draw us away from God. And we might lie back and our lies sound a lot like, well, I'm not hurting anybody. Lie. I can stop anytime I want to. Lie. I'm not nearly as sinful as that person or I can handle the consequences or, or I've gone too far and God will never forgive me. Lie, lie, lie. And eventually we just run out of ammo because we're limited, but Satan keeps going. So if you want to go lie for lie with the father of lies, you will lose, you will die, you will be devoured. So what do we do? What do we do if we find ourselves under enemy fire and we're holding a cap gun of lies? Drop and stop the cap. Pick up the word of truth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. It says it in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to this. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Much better choice, much better weapon of choice when you find yourself under enemy fire. Well, that's not the only wrong weapon we pick up. <laughs> Allow me to introduce you to, maybe this is your weapon of choice. You're just a fluffy little cotton ball. The cotton ball of your flesh. This represents any time you try to go against the enemy in your own fluffy little cotton ball power. I'm going to aim straight at Stuart first. Y'all agree? <laughs> There's no threat. Does this have any stopping power at all? I trust the limited ability of the cotton ball enough to aim this at my mama. And we laugh, this is funny. Guess who else laughs when you come into battle with the cotton balls of your own strength? The enemy that's prowling and growling around looking for anyone to devour, and they go, oh, oh, they got the cotton, they're doing the cotton ball thing again. Hey, watch this, this will be fun. When the enemy thinks that we're going to do anything by our own power, I couldn't even reach my dad. The enemy laughs at us and said, that one's easy pickings. That one's going to be easy to devour. We can imagine it like this, that the enemy comes to your front door. You open the door. It's, it's an enemy, the, the, the adversary, like a prowling, growling lion looking for anyone to devour. And he says, I'd like, I'd like to come into your house, like, like to eat you and your family. What do you say? You say, I, you shall not pass. And the enemy looks around going, Who, who's going to stop me? And you're like, me. Me. My fluffy cotton ball limited power. And the enemy goes, hollers at all the rest of the enemy, all the rest of the spiritual forces in the dark, evil places, going, boys, come in, this is going to be a feast. This one is easy pickings. He thinks he can fend us off by his own little limited cotton ball power. When the answer should have been, how are you going to stop me? 
Well, the God of angels' armies is, is by my side. The vast strength of the Lord, right? We just read that. From the vast strength of the Lord, his strength, way more than fluffy little cotton balls, his vast strength that in the very beginning created the heavens and the earth just by his voice, just by his word, by his command, and it was good. The same God that can part the waters and rescue his children. The same God that can raise the, the dead, raise his son from the dead, raise us from the dead. That kind of vast power is what we come against the enemy forces. When we pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 3, says it like this. For although we live in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. Since the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are of the power through God for the demolition of strongholds, we demolish arguments and every proud thing that is raised up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. So I didn't mean to insult your intelligence to think that you might pick up cap guns or cotton balls and slingshots. You know you've got the sword. But I've got two swords, and you get to choose which one you are wielding, and hopefully you are wielding it well. This first sword, it's pretty, it's long, it's impressive. Any guesses if it's sharp or not? This is a replica from, can you guess which movie? Lord of the Rings? All right, you just got to remember, like, you didn't know if you wanted to admit that you're a sci-fi nerd. Okay, yeah, Lord of the Rings, this was, this was King's sword, and uh, it is apparently not sharp at all. It's just dusty. Oh, that's a great analogy to it, too. It's just, it's just dusty. It is impressive. It looks strong. It has no real stopping power against an enemy. And if I'm honest, I would say, and you hope that, you know, the guy that you give a microphone and a pulpit to is going to be honest— I would hope that this is no longer representative of me, but for way too many years, it was very much like me. Because I was so focused on appearances, got to look the part, play the part. In every right place, look like that place. So if you come to church, look like church, smell like church, speak like church. 1994, I came back to this church with my, with dating this pretty little girl. She invited me to come to church. We came to this church, the church where we, we know people and people love us. We want to hear a good Brother Doug message. And I had this, I had this Bible. It looks really well worn. I'm holding my Bible. And that little pretty, that pretty young girl is now my wife. But back then, she had the audacity. She's still pretty audacious. Back then, though, she had the audacity to see me in church holding a well worn Bible. She had the audacity to ask me. So what are you reading in your Bible these days? It sounds like a simple question, unless the sword you're holding is really just a prop, just a well-shined, impressive-looking decoration. The sword of the Spirit in our hands as a decoration strikes no fear into the enemy. Worse yet, your, your sword on the nightstand or on the bookshelf or in this case, my Bible made a really perfect armrest in my old Corvette. It fit just right there. I thought it'd be good and maybe help deter thieves. If they saw a Bible in the Corvette, they might leave my car alone. That was the reasoning for the Bible in my car. That's the reason for the well-worn on my Bible. But when my then-girlfriend had the audacity to ask me what I was reading in the Bible, and I had no real answer, what I did have was real shame. Not shame from her, she wasn't judging me, but I had shame because I knew that I needed to be in God's Word. I knew that I was starving myself. But I prayed every night, God, make me a better Christian. God, make me a better Christian. It was a common prayer because I knew I was living in a very common series of mistakes on a regular basis and come back to Sundays and hopefully get cleaned up a little bit, just go back out into the world, make the same mistakes. But pray, God, make me a better Christian. It wasn't until I had the conviction and a Holy Spirit hunger that I prayed, God, give me a hunger for your word. And he did. I had an insatiable hunger for God's word began to devour through the Gospels, and then read the whole thing in a year finally. And what I, what I learned back as a Bible driller back in the day, just knowing where to find the verses, now I knew where to find them and how to apply them into my life. My life was not just like a little decorative sword anymore. 
God began to give it strength in my life. Drop the decoration and pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. There's an old Hank Williams senior song that would, it would characterize well those of us that have been wielding a decorative sword that's just gathering dust. Hank Williams sings, of all the other books you'll find, there's none salvation holds. Get the dust off your Bible and redeem your poor soul. <laughs> you laugh, but can you... Yeah. If you can't say amen, you got to say ouch. <laughs> so we're going to not have the decorative sword. We're going to pick up, here's another sword. Ooh, you're already nervous because you realize it's in the sheath. That boy's going to cut himself. So this one is double-edged. This one is absolutely sharp. I will not demonstrate how sharp it is. But can you imagine a good grip strength on a strong sword? Wielded by someone who knows how to wield the sword well. Like from 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's get to work. Let's get to work. You don't just naturally begin to handle a sword well. It takes preparation. It takes time in the Word. It takes being surrounded by other swordsmen who are also training in the Word. Like 2 Timothy 2.15 says then, to do your best, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the Word of truth. When we handle the Word of truth, do you know the people? Can you see them? Can you call up them? Whether they are in this room or they've gone to be with the Lord already, can you call up the people who can correctly handle the word of truth? A strong grip on the word of God. Maybe they can't open the jar in a pickle jar, but they've got a strong grip on the word of God. Can I tell you about one of the greatest swordsmen I've ever known? One of the greatest swordsmen is my mom's mom. I call her Mimi. Mimi had a, a firm grip on the Word of God. And in fact, true story, one night as, as Mimi was living alone as a, as a widow, she hears a crash in the middle of the night. Something breaking through the living room window and knocking over the aquarium. So she startles and she comes to the living room to find that she's face to face with an intruder. An angry intruder demanding that, that she give him money or he's going to hurt her. And face to face with an intruder, Mimi, with the peace that passes all understanding, says, I don't think you would hurt me. I think you just need to read your Bible. <laughs> and to which this, this intruder, this criminal, responds to my Mimi, I don't have a Bible. <laughs> now, any good Southern Baptist woman who hears that would do what? <laughs> Give him a Bible. So. <laughs> So that's a true story. Mimi picked up the sword of the Spirit, which is the? She gave the Word of God to a criminal, and he was gone. In her later years, even from her hospital bed before she passed away, as she was fading in and out of lucidity, she was quoting Scripture, and she was encouraging the hospital staff to pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I hope that the Word of God is so deep in our hearts like that. We wield it well. A double-edged sword. I said we'd end with a story in the wilderness as well. When the Son of God came into this world and he was baptized and then he went into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry and he was tempted. And each time he was tempted by the enemy, that prowling adversary looking for the Son of God to devour. Jesus responded each time with Scripture three times, it is written, it is written, it is written. Each of the temptations Christ faced, we are familiar with. The first was like a, a lust of the flesh. I'm hungry. My flesh is hungry. I need to feed my flesh. So Satan said, hey, turn the stones to bread. Jesus responds, and he goes, he goes into Deuteronomy. He is prepared. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He's got a, a word ready. Remember, the sword of the Spirit. So the sword 
in the Greek, and the, oh, I'm so nervous to try to do Greek in the church where a Greek scholar <laughs> preaches. When Paul says Greek, sword, he's saying makira. Makira is a short, sar- sharp sword. A short, straight, sharp sword ready to, to plunge or to cut. So the word of God that says word, the word is rhema. Rhema is, is like this, this short, ready word for when the enemy comes at us with accusations and lies and words, we have a short, sharp word ready to reply. So Jesus had that. He was ready. I'm going to quote Deuteronomy. Can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then in the wilderness, Satan's not done. He's not an idiot. He's assessing the threat. He thinks he has a chance. So he goes... Let's go with pride. Let's see if I can poke him in the pride area, pride of life, pride in his own power. Let's take him to a high place where he can see the, the way down and go, hey, just throw yourself, throw yourself off and see if, see, if you, see if you hurt yourself. God's got you, right? If God's got you, he gets you. Jesus responds, you know, put, don't put the Lord your God to the test. He's got the word ready, a short, sharp word to respond to the enemy, to the adversary. Satan's not done, so there's a third temptation. It goes with like the lust of the eyes. He takes him to a high place and shows him everything. So I'll give you everything. Everything you see, you can have if you just bow down and worship me. To which Christ digs back deep into the book of Deuteronomy again. He's got a sharp word ready. He knows that the word says... Love the Lord your God and serve him only. And then away from me, Satan. So as as Christ was wielding the word well there in the wilderness, there will be a day that he's going to pick the sword back up. We go to the last book in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 15 and 16. Gives us a a demonstration of Christ as he returns as a victorious, conquering war hero because he was undefeated. He was undefeated in the wilderness by the temptations of the adversary. He was undefeated by the grave that could not hold him. So when he returns, and he will return, we see that his feet were like fine bronze, as if fired in a furnace, his voice like the sound of cascading waters, and a sharp double-edged sword comes from his mouth. But until that day, brothers and sisters, pray that we would be faithful soldiers, faithful harvest workers, that our lives would personify well Proverbs 27, 17, that as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. No more dull decorations that aren't useful, but iron sharpens iron, well handled and ready to be wielded. So my question for us is, is who are you sharpening right now? And who is sharpening you? And my invitation as well is, I've been going to battle on my own strength. I've been lying to myself for way too long that I've got it all covered and I don't need God. This is the invitation that we would drop those false weapons, pick up the true weapon, the word of God. And then respond well to the word of God. Because hearing is one thing, but then hearing it and responding and doing. This is the invitation that you would trust the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Will you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven is you and you alone are holy, holy, holy. You give us your holy word. You've breathed into us as well. So that that your creation and your word have this God breathed in common. Let us draw near to you. Thank you for your word. Through Christ we pray in Jesus' name. The church said, amen. 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 I'm so glad you took time to worship with us online this morning. I know that some of you are a part of our Crossroads family. Remember that we love you and miss you when you can't be present with us. Let us know if there's any way we can be a blessing to you in the coming days. But I also know that for some of you, this may be the first time that you've had any contact with our church or or maybe 
all you know of us so far is online worship. We want you to know that we love you and care about you too. Though I don't know you, I want to be of assistance to you also. It's like Michael Buble's song says, I, I just haven't met you yet. If you haven't, take a minute to visit our website and fill out our guest registration form. The link for it is on the front page of cbcsa.net. And if by chance you'd like to visit with me about some need for prayer or spiritual counsel, feel free to text me on my cell phone, 210-422-7316. I will be happy to return your call as soon as I can. Above all else, we want you to come to know and experience the love and grace of God through Jesus Christ. We think we can help with that. God bless. Have a great week. And worship with us again soon, if possible, in person. I haven't met you yet, but I would love to have the chance. It's so good to have Chad Purcell here this morning. Chad, you know, they say uh, a prophet is only without honor in his own land. But I want to honor Chad this morning for the gospel message he brought to us. We are so proud of you, buddy. It's so good. Thank you for sharing with us this morning. Y'all, I know you've been challenged this morning. I pray that you'll take the word of God and hide it in your heart. Use it when you're out there in the world today, because I'm telling you, it's like the Bible says, uh, the devil is roaming around, seeking whom he may devour, and he will devour us. So I'm thankful that you're here. Continue to pray for our pastor as he's recovering uh, at home, and I pray that he'll be with us next week, as I'll be out of town. By the way, next week is a time change. Isn't that when you lose an hour of sleep? Yeah, I'll be in Arizona sleeping in. But <laughs> But I'll be here, I promise to be here on the next one, November 3rd, whenever we gain an hour of sleep. But so thankful that you're here this morning. God bless you. Uh, Brother Lauren, come and lead us.